you're not going to be able to just borrow against the policy, pay another premium and do that. If you were, there's a better alternative. You could do a much bigger policy right up front, mm -hmm. right? Where yeah. you could get a lot of death benefits. So you're not applying for it over and over with one policy and having premium financed with this, where a bank actually finances the premium rather than you financing the premium. And then you're at least getting all your death benefit at once and a much bigger policy. Love it. All these questions at GarrettGunderson.com forward slash WWGD. What would Garrett do? Used to be people thought I looked like Jesus. I got really gray though. Yeah. <laughs> if if my Jesus wife was, like, was able really to get old gray. enough. He had a more stressful life. I know? know. A little bit. Yeah. All right. So this, this question here um, from Dan says, yeah. if a person can fund a whole life policy, mm -hmm. IBS, infinite banking, banking system. solution system. system, with up to 90% available to loan back to themselves in the first year, what keeps people from taking a loan from one policy to fund the premium of another? Mm. Wouldn't, you making it, wouldn't you be making interest twice on the same dollar, assuming that you don't just pay the loan back from the first policy? Well, so, all right, let's talk about that. So this is one of the challenges I have with infinite banking as a whole is this idea of positive arbitrage being the purpose and the intent and the only use or the only reason that people want to get a policy. Right. Right. It neglects any value in the death benefit. Right. And, and it's also misleading, like wildly misleading. Like the, the idea, I think it's really important. To understand. I like that people at least are asking questions and, and advancing these thoughts, but like we need 100%. to get to the reality of, how would this work and what risk would you face? Well, so let's, let's talk about that for a sec because, um, there's always mortality charges and cost of insurance and admin fees. And all those fees are the highest in the early years of the policy, mm -hmm. right? If the policy stays in force long enough and you do your job and you pay your premiums and you know, you live long enough, obviously, um, the, the policy is going to become very efficient. You know, once I, th I think once you hit your 10 in a policy, especially an overfunded policy, it's probably not going to be a more efficient asset in your life, right? But you've got to be willing to do the first six, seven, eight years first, right? right. So if like when we talk about um, like human behavior and user behavior and whatnot uh, around policies, okay, if, if you've got policies that are 10 years old, right? So like if you go to borrow against your policy um, at year 10 or 12 or 15, you can behave a little bit differently with that money because it's a bit more mature. The dividends are more efficient. The costs are lower. The, it's like an airplane taking off is going to use a lot more gas once it's like cruising out. hundred percent. And so you can get away with it at that point in time. Mm -hmm. The problem is if, if you, and, and, and from that perspective, there are instances and circumstances where you could borrow against it and never have to pay it back and you're okay. And I've done videos that show like, what does it look like if you borrow? But it has to like, certain things have to happen. And totally, totally. Life doesn't quite work that simple. 100%. And, but what we know for certain is that if you borrow from year one in your policy and you never manage that loan, you're probably gonna have problems. All right, let's take a look at an okay. actual policy so, here. So let's look at a policy here. So here's what we have. We have a, we have a 1090 policy, 10% 10 base, 90% paid up additions. And so that's overfunded 90%. And you can see out of this $10,137 premium, uh, you have $8,911. So a couple things to know, like this is basically 90%. Um, remember in order to do this, we had to do it. There always has to be a term rider, right? Because otherwise you mech it, which means right. that you lose some of the tax benefits, right? So out of this, it's not just 10% base, 90% paid up additions. It's 10% base. Term and insurance. then term insurance costs, and then the balance goes right. into because that's a pretty high patients. death benefit, two hundred twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, off of whatever the base premium is. Totally right. The base premium being what, like one thousand two eighty five. Yeah, but that's because of the term rider. Correct. Yeah, and so so what we look at here though is like, all right, after the insurance uh, costs, after the term rider fees, after everything with the with the paid up additions that go into it. You're looking at $8,911 of the net cash value year one. Okay. Out of this money, you have 90%. Let's just call it 90% that you could access through a policy loan. Okay. So let's just call it $8,000. Okay. Keep numbers round. So you could, you could borrow against this at $8,000. So what the person, is it Dan, was, was asking is saying, hey, why wouldn't I just borrow against that $8,000 and yeah. use that $8,000 to buy 
another policy yeah. for eight thousand dollars. It's because the idea here is all right. Let's use let's use a, a really simple example um, that that I think a lot of influencers and and agents are creating content around and misleading people, and this creates confusion because it's where questions like this come from. So I get it, and I love that he's asking this question because I rail against this all the time because I think it's one of the most misrepresented elements of whole life insurance. As much as I like to bang like on was, IUL. We're talking about risk management, yet yeah. this is creating risk. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And and yeah. And so so here's the deal. So is it, how much different is it than being like, I could put 10% down on a property and then I buy it with 90% mm -hmm. loan. And then I, now, even though I had 40% down, I can do that with three more properties. But totally. now you've got four properties. And if the market doesn't cooperate or something happens, or what if it was a variable interest right. rate on the loan, or yeah. there's a number of things where people got over leverage in real estate and totally. they get hurt. Right. And so, so as long as you manage whole life properly and your expectations and your behavior with it are in alignment with reality, it's really safe leverage. If you get out of alignment with that, then, and you, and you don't understand the moving parts, it is interesting you can get yourself into trouble. The world has kind of gone this route where it's like, okay, well, here's a tool how can we make that much better? But then you lose the very reason of having the tool. I know it's like, Hey, here's something that's risk mitigated capital. Yeah. Alternative to maybe bonds and mm -hmm. it prevents that capital appreciation when interest rates raise or maybe yep. does better than a savings account most of the time with a bunch of benefits. Yeah. If it's good, more must be better. Let's just go and now strip a lot of that. Yeah. You know, risk managed capital to take more risk because now it's in the form of a loan getting another policy. Yep. It's crazy. Yeah. And, and the sensationalization that these influencers that talk about that it's, it's mind numbing to me, but what we're looking at here is like, if you let's, let's just say you take this $8,000 loan and you buy another policy. Um, you know, you have the law of diminishing returns because like, let's say, cause if, if, if the principle is like, you could do it with the first one, why not do it with the second one? Why not do it with the third one? At the end of the day there, you're going to hit your, uh, the amount of insurance that the insurance company is going to be willing to give you. So there's that. But secondly, from just from a, a dollars and cents perspective, it doesn't make any sense because here's the deal. Like the way it's sold and the way that Dan probably thought like it would make sense is that, all right, let's say I could borrow in this instance against this company, 5.7 is the loan rate. Let's say I could have a 6% dividend, right? If that were the case, and I'm not saying it is, but I'm just using a kind of a scenario here. If I could borrow at 5.7 and earn six, this Dan's going, well, that's arbitrage. Why couldn't I do that? But there's fees. But there's fees, right? So when you, whenever you look, and this is this is something that most people don't talk about, like as much as you and I love whole life, the dividend is wildly misrepresented on how because it credits it's gross. people. It's the gross dividend right? before expense. Right. So every company, I don't care what company, there's one company that is an exception to this, and I'll talk about it in a second. Every company declares a dividend. And let's say it's 6%. Um, that's, that's the gross dividend. They're going to back out mortality charges, fees, operating costs of the company. Because remember, as the policyholder, you are participating in the profitability of the company. They're saying a 6% dividend. Then they're going to back out their expenses to get to profitability. And that's what you share. And that's the dividend. And so, like, to me, the dividend is, is kind of misleading, quite frankly. And it, and it's, and there's no guarantee you could have a company that says that that documents 5.65 mm -hmm. or 5.5 for a dividend and another company that documents six and they may end up paying the same dividend. You know what I mean? Because it's revenue versus profit. hundred percent. And so from that perspective, that's why I always say I hate selling off of illustrations and I can't stand when we run into a situation where you know, they're like, oh, this company looks way better on paper than this company. It's like, eh, it doesn't really matter. Like the illustration, you know, it, it, it's outside of year one is kind of smoke and mirrors, right? Like yeah, someone might have extent. a great resume, but not be a better employee than someone that's just yeah. better at their job, but doesn't know For how sure. to write it down on paper as well. For sure. And so there's one company um, and we do work with this company, but like, and I'm not saying they're the best and I'm not saying what, but I do like this element of them. It's one America they refuse to declare their dividend. They refuse to be public about it. And so some people look at that as like um, shifty. <laughs> like they look at it as like, well, why wouldn't they declare a dividend? And their, their stance is like, we're just not playing that game. Like, because it's all kind of misleading anyway. So 
we're going to just give you a higher guarantee, which is what they do. And that's kind of what, what they sell on is their guarantees are better. And we're going to pay a dividend too, but like, we're not going to sit here and mislead you as to a higher dividend and then I reduce it American on you. Policy, so. Yeah. So yeah. like, you know what I mean? And so they're a smaller company. They're a great company in my opinion. Um, you know, they're, they have different things they do well and there's certain situations are great, but like, I do think that's a unique, I, I like just principally speaking that culturally they're just like, you know what? Like, so the first issue here is, is net principle. versus gross. Yeah. The second issue is the interest rate that you're actually paying yeah. to borrow the yeah. money and now starting a new policy that's in its least efficient year. For sure. That, and, and that part, that, that first least efficient year. So like when we look at this, let, look at this illustration here, right? So you, you got uh, $10,137 going in, 890, uh, 8,911. Next year, 10,137, it grows by 9,719. Nine, uh, 9, so you could see there's extra costs and everything that are going in there now. Which by the way, we're in third year, 10,137, 10,178. So I just good. want to point this out to other yeah. commenters yeah. on YouTube. Like, yeah. they're like, where are you getting it? Where it's at break even, yeah. you know, and the third year. Yeah, well, that's, that's the amount coming in. It's pretty solid. Yeah, that's pretty solid. And so, you know, I, I, I just look at this as like, you're not going to be able to just borrow against the policy, pay another premium and do that. If you were, there's a better alternative. You could do a much bigger policy right up front, mm -hmm. right? Where yeah. you could get a lot of death benefits. So you're not applying for it over and over with one policy and having premium financed with this, where a bank actually finances the mm -hmm. premium rather than you financing the premium. And then you're at least getting all your death benefit at once and a much bigger policy. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's an option if you're a high net worth person and, and you have that and you want to leverage bank money. Uh, I'm not a fan of premium. Right finance. now right it's now. a little bit tougher because interest rates are so high and a lot of people are taking advantage of that during low interest rate times. I know I, you know, that's a whole nother conversation. I've never been a fan of premium finance even in the low interest rate environment. Cause I knew that this was going to happen. Right. And so those people that got it in low, now they're, they're having to pay high interest rates. And so if they didn't plan for that, and if they're not really high net worth and can't just come out of pocket to make up the difference, you know, they're exposed to right. risk. And to me, the whole purpose of doing something like this, I'm just saying to, it's a better step than this. hundred percent. Not 100%. saying that it's the, the yeah, yeah, solution. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, because like, here's the thing you're going through paramedics each time. Totally. That's a lot of time. Yeah, it's all You're paying, you know, the least efficient time in the policy. Mm -hmm. You've now got multiple loans that you're managing and multiple policies that you're managing yeah. from those multiple loans. Yeah. We don't know what the dividends are going to be in the future. Right. It, we don't know what interest rates are going to be in the future. It's like you're just putting yourself at risk. At the end of the day, the if, 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 if you were able to get positive arbitrage, it would make sense. But that's not what it's about. And you certainly don't get positive arbitrage in any policy in the first couple of years. You know, if you wanted to wait 10, 12 years and, you know, we're in an environment where interest rates lower and dividends are still higher, you may be able to pull it off, but it will certainly it be requires regular attention yes. and maintenance. Exactly. So All right. just know that. Cool. cool. There you go, Dan. Hey, thanks for watching. I appreciate it. And if you're enjoying these videos, well, there's good news. More where that came from. So go ahead and click through and watch the next video now.